The old schoolhouse has stood on the corner of Holt Road in Washington for well over a hundred years. The Brick Gun School, named after the farmer who originally owned the land, was built in 1886 to replace the log cabin Delhi District 7 schoolhouse built shortly after the Civil War. The Brick School cost just under $900, $899.67, but a hundred dollars of that sum went for new schoolhouse desks. Over the years, classrooms of thirty to forty pupils were educated by a long list of de dedicated teachers, mostly hired by the term for twenty to sixty dollars a month. Winter term teachers were usually men, hired to deal with those difficult older boys who only came to school when they weren't needed on the farm. Students didn't advance in school by age or grade in the 1800s or early 1900s. Their progress was marked only by their ability to master the McGuffey readers. And those farm boys who spent just winter months in school often didn't make it through more than the third grade reader before they turned 16 and were done with classes for good. Those classes of thirty to forty students at gun school were all ages, six through sixteen. The teachers, male or female, were a hardy lot, for in addition to teaching thirty to forty students ages six through sixteen, teachers' rules included get to school in time to have the room comfortably warm when school starts, see that the fire is safe, all doors and windows locked at the end of the day, Take no personal time for reading or business during the school day, and supervise all children at recess. In 1906, the Gun School Board hired Miss Margaret Spence to do all of this, plus instruct her pupils, for forty dollars a month. She must have been a remarkable woman, for in addition to her teaching, supervisory, and custodial duties, she left some detailed notes of classroom activities and recess games. I came across those notes back in 2003 when Holt Schools renovated the gun schoolhouse as they built the new high school down the road. Besides the typical games of the era, she told of gathering flowers in the nearby woods, fishing and finding tadpoles in neighboring Frodert's pond, no woods or pond near the school today, you say? Well, there are ponds out in front of Holt High School, and certainly in wet springs there is no shortage of water along parts of Holt Road. In fact, if you read histories of the area, these stories tell about how Holt Road disappeared every spring. <laughs> Even though each year when the snow melted they would cut down trees to pave the road with logs, the lo swamp would suck those logs down into the mud. Old timers told tales of traveling the road from Diamondale to Holt in the morning, only to have the road disappear before they could make it back home in the afternoon. Now, attempting to pave the road with logs may explain where the woods went. In fact, I always wondered why, when they built a new middle school nearby on Washington Road, they called it Washington Woods. There are no woods. But over the years, there have been plenty of water problems at Washington Woods. The water problem started before we even moved in. Builders told me how they had problems putting in the skylight roof on the library. Every time they brought in heavy equipment to put in the glass, the equipment sunk into the mud that was the library floor. They couldn't pour the floor until the ceiling was in. They couldn't put the ceiling in while the mud was sucking down the equipment. Water continues to be a problem at Washington Woods even today. There are no shortages of water-stained ceiling tiles, soaked carpet spots by hall windows are currently covered over with new carpeting. And no one knows the mystery as to why the water that gushed up in a fountain in the middle of the front sidewalk now streams through the lobby wall after hard rain. 
There was another mystery back in the early years of Washington Woods. Water-soaked books. Students would return water-stained books to the library. Moldy math books, soggy social studies books showed up in classes. And finally, after a few years, the wet book problem was traced back to students in a certain homeroom. Students, in fact, with certain lockers. Lockers 524 and 525. Sure enough, it seems that water somehow came through the ceiling into those lockers. Various solutions were tried, like drilling a hole above the locker, which only meant that the water flooded through the top of the locker. So for a few years we just didn't assign those lockers to students. But when we ran out of dry lockers, one custodian came up with a neat solution. He hung a bucket under the hole. Now as long as the bucket is empty during the rainy season, the lockers stay dry. Moldy books were not a problem for teacher Margaret Spence back in 1906. Back then, students had to purchase their own school books. In fact, records show that in 1905, all gun students had to purchase a new spelling book from the American Book Publishing Company for $1.76. I was doing some further reading of Miss Spence's 1906 notes as we were getting ready to reopen the old school in 2003. And to put those spelling books to good use, Miss Margaret Spence held many weekly spelling bees to give all of her pupils, aged 6 through 16, a chance to spell their stuff at the end of the school year. The last day of school each year there was a final contest to determine the best speller of gun school. She awarded a, a special ribbon or medal, her records didn't really specify the exact award, to the winner of that final spelling bee. Of course, her weekly records show that usually it was a girl, an older girl, that won the spelling bee. And that's why I was surprised to see the record from the end of the school year in 1907. On the last day of school, May 24th, the winner of the final gun spelling bee was one William Franklin, Jr., age 10. I thought that was somewhat remarkable. I mean, here was a boy, 10 years old, who beat all the older students, all of the girls, and won the school spelling award. Hastily, I turned the pages of Miss Spence's registers. The next school year, 1907-1908, William Franklin's name showed up with some regularity in the willing, weekly spelling contest, but not so at the end of the year. In 1908, the winner was Ellie something or other, age 16. In fact, I couldn't find William Franklin's name anywhere. I searched the following years, 1908-1909, what happened to William Franklin, Jr.? You say maybe he moved away, but no, his father's name, William Franklin, Sr., appeared on many of the gun school records. In fact, it seemed that it was a younger William Franklin, Sr. who had worked even on building the school itself back in 1886. So what happened to champion speller William Franklin, Jr.? I wondered for a long time until one year I happened to be down at a meeting at the State Library of Michigan in the Historical Museum. <laughs> this was a bit before the Internet provided so many research opportunities, but the State Library had a collection of old area newspapers on microfiche. Out of curiosity, I began scrolling through the old Lansing area newspapers, 1907, 1908, and sure enough, there was a brief mention of the gun school spelling champion, William Franklin, Jr., May 24, 1907. I hastily scrolled ahead to 1908, and yes, there was the gun school spelling bee, uh, Ellie something or another, age 16, winter. But there was another article on that same page that caught my eye boy drowns on way to school. 
William Franklin, Jr., age 11, drowned in Frodert's Pond on his way to gun school, May 25, 1908. There was some speculation he was in a hurry to get to school, tried to take a shortcut to it close to the edge of the swampy pond, but William Franklin, Jr., age 11, died May 25, 1908. I printed out the microfiche articles to show the students at Washington Woods. I was making notes trying to put the entire story together for them just before we were supposed to have our own end of the year spelling bee. And as I wrote down the dates for the gun school end of year spelling bees, some numbers jumped out at me. May 24th, 1907, the year William Franklin Jr. won. May 25th, 1908, the year William Franklin Jr. drowned. I find myself abbreviating things, as I often do, writing down notes. May 24th, 524. May 25th, 525. Where had I seen those numbers before? The two lockers that continually flooded. Lockers 524 and 525. Was the ghost of William Franklin, Jr. still haunting us? Can I show you the proof? Sadly, I cannot. Oh, I had Margaret Spence's notes. I, I had the printouts from the newspaper article. I kept them all in the teacher's desk at the restored gun schoolhouse until December 2008. That December, we had a cold spell below zero. The pipes froze at the gun schoolhouse. No one remembered to keep it warm, as Miss Spence had done in 1908. The hot water pipes froze and burst, and because they were in the ceiling, hot water poured down the entire schoolhouse for days until a lady driving by saw the water gushing out the front door. The records were lost in the water damage that also took out the original floor of the school. The floor was replaced but all I have to show you is the bucket over the lockers, 524 and 525, the bucket that continues today to fill with each rainstorm. At Washington Woods each year, we hold a fifth grade spelling bee at the end of the year to honor William Franklin. The gun schoolhouse is available to Holt students who can spend a day or a week there with their class, learning the way that kids did in the old days. Hanging inside the gun schoolhouse is the actual photo of Miss Margaret Spence and her class, taken on the last day of school, 1908. It was Miss Spence's last day as a teacher there for a new teacher was hired the following year. Of course, William Franklin is not in the photo, but what about his ghost? You may ask if the story of William Franklin is true, and I will tell you it is truly a story. It is up to you to decide where the truth stops and the story starts.